Okay, everybody, welcome to the afternoon uh, portion of uh, today. Uh, we're very excited and uh, privileged to have a uh, really a great second half, I think, in terms of scale that reorients us, uh, particularly with the next panel at a very finite scale, professional, economic, people in place scale, which I think will uh, help contextualize the day. Um, but to uh, lead us into that, uh, we have an afternoon uh, introduction and, and brief lecture by uh, Professor um, Adam Sobel, who has really led the charge here. Uh, his background in applied mathematics and climate science, uh, 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 and professor here in, in, in both uh, in a variety of departments. Uh, you can read his biography in its extended form. But he has really led the charge here at Columbia University in terms of extreme weather and climate change. Um, and we think in climate change very often in incremental terms. Um, but I think there's obviously, uh, whether it's uh, the, the charging politics of extreme weather or violence or whatever that may be, extreme events and extreme weather play a very important uh, part of the dialogue. And he has certainly led that uh, initiative uh, here at the university. So please welcome uh, Professor Adam. Adam Sobel. Thank you, Jesse, and the organizers for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm jointly appointed in, uh, at Lamont, uh, uh, like Richard, and uh, who spoke earlier, and at the engineering school. Um, and we are doing this thing called the Columbia Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. I'm not going to talk about my own research here. I'm going to try to uh, address the the charge that I, as I understood it, that was uh, given to me from Jesse and the organizers to introduce the afternoon. And I'm going to try to say something about how, uh, not really how does the, how, uh, the better title might be how could climate information or how should it influence the design process. And of course I know very little about the design process. I'm a climate scientist, but I'm just going to give some general um, thoughts that seem to me uh, relevant. Um, so this is my question I started off thinking about as I put this together. What do architects, designers, and planners need to know about climate? And what can climate scientists do to help uh, uh, tell them what they need to know? And this, the background slide here, I don't know if you've been following this in the news, it hasn't gotten all that much coverage as Paris and uh, San Bernardino have been going on. But the, the city of Chennai in um, south, southern co uh, east Southeast coast of India has been flooded severely first a few weeks ago and now again in the last few days. Um, and this is the title of a, of a recent story, uh, arguing that basically, although the, the rains have been very extreme and, and protracted, I think they got something like 14 inches uh, on Wednesday, um, but that in the past the city could have handled it better because they had a lot of um, drainage, wetlands, rivers, uh, dr drainage basins that have been uh, paved over. So, created by greedy town planners and dumb engineers. You can, you can find that from just two days ago. So, um, I'm going to talk here not about mitigation. And in this context, mitigation, if you're building something, mitigation means keeping its carbon footprint low, for example, energy efficiency or efficient use of water or other resources. I'm not going to talk about that. Of course, that's critically important. We heard a lot about mitigation this morning. I'm going to talk about adaptation, which is how do you build something that can withstand the climate in which it's going to exist and function as it's supposed to. Um, and I'm going to give two examples uh, from, that are close to my own experience, uh, and they both happen to involve trains. I actually put them together before realizing that they were both about trains. I don't know what that says about me, but... Um. So this is the first one. Uh, this is the headline from the, the German newspaper Deutsche Welle from five years ago. And I had this experience not in 2010, but in 2013. I was traveling in Germany in the, in the summer, and there were some very hot days. And I learned that on, on the high-speed German trains, the air conditioning um, actually was, I don't know if it's still true, but it was true two years ago, it just doesn't function. They turn it off when it's above a temperature threshold. I think it's 32 degrees centigrade. And that's because it wasn't, the trains weren't designed to operate above that temperature. They thought it hardly ever happens in Germany. And then all of a sudden it's been happening a lot. And these are high-speed trains, so there's, if the air conditioning's off, there's actually no ventilation. You can't open the window because they're going too fast. And, and so it's really quite uh, unbearable on these trains. And I had that experience. And um, this had happened a few years before. And this is an a extended quote from the um, article that I just found on Google as I was reading about this the other night to try to understand you know, the experience I'd had a couple years before. And so this official uh, from Deutsche Bahn, who was uh, the German train, you know, uh, national train system, who was interviewed for this article, admitted that the, the cooling systems installed in some high-speed trains couldn't cope with temperatures over 32 degrees C. It says they routinely fail to keep the interior cool. My understanding is they simply have to turn them off because they're not designed to function above that. 
Um, and he, the official blamed it on climate change. Well, we've, we've looked at the weather here, and we found that in the last 20 years, only five days were hotter than 37. I don't know if 37 is really the threshold and not 32. But at any rate, three of those happened last weekend, this summer in 2010. And his argument is that, well, the standards were made in 1990, so it, you know, how could we be expected to have prepared for this? So without, we could argue about whether you know, this is a good defense or not, um, you know, whether in 19, the science, the climate science and the climate itself have changed a lot since 1990 and maybe, you know, Deutsche Bank couldn't have been expected to know um, the conditions they'd be functioning under. But at any rate, it's not going to be an adequate defense in the future because now we're quite certain that this, uh, you know, it's going to keep getting hotter. Um, this is another example about trains. Um, this is South Ferry Station at the end of the number one line, which runs outside of our campus here. And uh, our subway system is um, 100 plus years old, so you could, again, you could argue, well, 100 years ago, what did we know uh, about all the, the risks that we know now from climate and, and extreme weather? But this particular station was opened in uh, 2012 at the cost of $550 million in a flood zone, you know, right next to the water, um, flood, completely flooded and sandy. The cost to fix it is estimated at $600 million. So it's totaled. It still hasn't not been fixed. And in this case, we did know that this could happen. This is the cover of a report um, put out in 1995 by a group of federal, uh, federal and state and local agencies about um, how to prepare the city and the tri-state area for in the event of a hurricane, um, a severe hurricane that could cause flooding and other problems. And most of it was about evacuations and things like that, but some of it was about infrastructure. And they, uh, the, the Weather Service, the Hurricane Center, actually the National Hurricane Center was who it was from the Weather Service, did a series of calculations of, of the worst possible storm surge they thought was likely to happen in New York City. And then the other people on the report overlaid that on a map of critical transit facilities uh, to estimate which ones could be flooded. And this is a picture from that report showing the old South Ferry Station. And I didn't draw this line. That was in the original report. So they're saying this is where the water could be in a potential Category 2 hurricane surge. Sandy, although Category 1 was Category 3 in terms of surge uh, by the scale typically used. So this was not a, you know, an unrealistic expectation. So it, close to 20 years before this new station opened, it was known that the risk was there. And, and this was subsequent reports only elaborated on the detail. Many of these reports were done here at Columbia and at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Radley Horton, who's on our panel, probably was involved in some of this work. Um, so this was a known risk but it wasn't um, designed for. The new station was built just across a flat plaza from this at the same, you know, the same flood risk and no, and no protection. So it's just sort of a poster child. And this is not, I don't think this is, uh, I don't think New York is any worse than anywhere else. It's that it was a long-term risk. It hadn't happened since the, in the modern history of the city that a flood this bad had happened. And so even though the science was there to predict it, it wasn't, um, it was, the, the money didn't, wasn't spent. And that's typical of what we see in response to disasters and disaster risk across the world that the only time things really happen is after the disaster has happened. No matter how much predictive science there is, we're not good at taking action before it happens. Uh, but it would be really good to change that, I guess. So it's, one can understand and design for even the risk of rare events. This is um, one of these stone tablets on the, on the shore in Japan in the place which was late, later flattened by the tsunami. It was known that there was a tsunami risk and people put up these stones saying, you know, don't build your house here. And then eventually that was forgotten, uh, but it's or ignored. But it's you know it is possible if something's happened, and if you have historical knowledge that there's some risk of something, then you can in principle prepare for that. Um, although it often isn't done. But I guess I'm going to argue that uh, climate change poses some challenges which are in some ways uh, new and maybe qualitatively different, and that we really have to think um, differently than in the past as far as dealing with risks. So this is how engineers. Um, think about risk. This is a, a plot actually from a, a Columbia PhD thesis, uh, Madeline Lopin in civil engineering, her advisor George Diodatus. I was on the committee, so I stole this figure from her. Um, this is return period versus flood depth at the battery. So return period is, you know, is it a 100-year storm or a 50-year storm or what? And really that just means, if it's a 100-year storm, it means the probability of it happening each year is one divided by 100. That's what that means. And so you, they, they look at the historical data and do a bunch of statistics and, uh, and mathematics to characterize um, what even the 100 or 200 year flood is. Even if they don't have 200 years of data, they, can, they have ways of doing that which uh, get more and more uncertain. This is some uncertainty. So this is the return period versus how high the water gets. So a 100 year flood you know, is a, whatever, a 3.8 meter um, 
flood above some reference level. And as you go out to longer and longer periods, you don't have as much enough data to constrain this, so the range of uncertainty gets wider. But that's sort of an understood uncertainty. That's an un uncertainty that comes out of statistical methods that have sort of rigorous ways of defining what that is. Um, but now with climate change, we're looking not just at plots like this, but plots like this. So this is a very um, commonly viewed plot from the most recent IPCC report showing the global projections for temperature change by 2100. And by the way, it's very misleading that we always cut these figures at 2100 because everything keeps going up after that, um, especially, uh, especially sea level, but, but temperature even as well. But at any rate, um, this is, you know, this is, these are the projections for 2100 if we very aggressively um, reduce emissions. And as was talked about this morning, there's no evidence that we're doing that. We're more on this path, which is where they're going up. But there's two kinds of uncertainty here. One is that what we call scenario uncertainty, which is that we don't know um, whether, you know, where we're going to be in this space, because it depends on, meteorology can't solve that. It depends on carbon emissions. It depends on economics and politics. And the other is that the, the width of each of these bands is an uncertainty range from using different climate models. And, that's all, and all the climate models could be wrong in some similar way. So just taking that range um, you know, may be somehow misleading, but we, you know, that's our best guide. It's the best science that we have. But my point here is just that these sources of uncertainty are qualitatively different than those which go into the kind of engineering estimates I I referenced earlier, and I think that's one of the reasons why this type of information is not yet being, uh, not being quickly absorbed into, into planning processes, is that the engineers haven't fully learned how to think about this kind of information and this kind of uncertainty yet. It's not just a matter of knowing what's happening in the future, it's a matter of characterizing what we know and what we don't know. Um, and it becomes the more true the longer the time frame you go, because if you're on short time frames, well, you know, this is the historical average, historical behavior, historical global mean surface temperature, that's what's plotted here. Um, uh, rep with you know the anomaly deviation from historical period and you know if you're in the sort of near term future well the climate's getting warmer but it's still more or less within the range of what we've seen in the past so maybe traditional ways of looking at it are almost okay but as you get further and further out we get more and more into conditions that haven't been seen in you know since the modern civilization evolved and so we really are thinking about a different um, in a different way about the environment that things are going to have to be done and be built in. So here's some questions that occurred to me as a climate scientist of thinking about what a designer would have to ask or answer as when designing something. How long should it last? If it's lasting a long time, then you really have to be prepared for conditions that haven't been observed in, the, in history or even reasonable prehistory. Um, Will, would a short-lived extreme kill the thing, like Sandy, where one flood and it's totaled, or could it survive a, a short-lived extreme, and is the risk more from a long-term change in average conditions where persistently you're, you're outside your design parameters by a little instead of being outside them by a lot for a short time? Um, is it better to be conservative at the outset and just design for, you know, do you have the, the money or the capability to design for the worst-case scenario, or, uh, or something that's not quite that, but if you expect that the time when you'll be exceeding your, your design parameters is, is far enough in the future, can you build in some capacity for adaptation? What, what probability of failure can you live with? I mean, so the Dutch supposedly build their flood control structures for 10,000 year flood. Well, it's not, and it's not gonna be the 10,000 year flood anymore as sea level rises, but that's, but that's extremely conservative. Most things aren't built that conservatively. You know, how much are you willing to pay for a larger margin of safety? You know, in the case of the German trains, it, it wasn't seemed worth it to be able to go above uh, 32 degrees. What pro so that's what probability of failure can you handle? And how do you handle these different um, sources of uncertainty that are um, from not knowing which model is right and not knowing what actions human are going to take? It's just, just a different kind of information uh, about a different kind of uncertainty about what conditions you, the thing you're designing or building will be subject to compared to the uncertainty of just knowing that you're in a stationary climate and things are fluctuating and you could randomly hit a, hit a big event. Even that we're not so good at when it comes to really long-term risks. So Sandy could have happened without climate change. We still wouldn't have been prepared for it. But, but when we know the climate's changing, it's different. And so the thought I want to close with, and this is a question for the historians, I guess, uh, since we have some here, is is there any historical analog to this? I, I'm not an, a historian or an expert, but it seems to me that I couldn't think of one. Is there any time in history anywhere where anything has been designed and built not just 
with some understanding a possibility that some freak event could happen, but with some reasonable degree of certainty that within a finite, you know, human lifetime sort of time frame or uh, generation or two, there's a confident expectation, even with some uncertainties, but nonetheless a confident expectation that there will be a systematic and effectively permanent change in the environment um, such that uh, the thing you're designing and building has to be able to withstand that. I, I, I'd be curious to hear if anybody in the panel can, can think of an example of that. I, I don't think there is one. So I really think that um, we're facing a, a different kind of situation where the normal human thought processes that go into, into constructing uh, the built environment are, are, are not adequate and we just have to be um, thinking differently about it. Okay, that's all I had. Thanks for your attention. It's a great lead into uncertainty. Uncertainty has always conditioned the design and construction of the built environment. The long useful life of buildings and infrastructure often far exceeds, and not always, the memory of the originating design intentions, values, and logic. The built environment has always been adapted to changing circumstances, shifting preferences, and dynamic environments. As we enter a new era of climate change, there is an acceleration of sensitivity to physical performance and socioeconomic costs and impacts. Yet we enter this era with a variety of institutional and social tensions, if not biases, which challenge our ability to prepare and to respond. One such tension is the desire to preserve the operations of the status quo in the short term through the perpetuation of the elastic functions of resilience. This is in contrast with the acknowledgement that society must transformally adapt to new forms of consumption and production that are not bound by the excessive and perilous consumer preferences that define our current vulnerabilities. While resilience in the short term and transformative adaptation in the long term offer potential synergies and conflicts, the uncertainty and indeterminacy of their respective meanings and applications in the practice of design is a major professional challenge. Likewise, as one moves across scales, resilience at one scale may be maladaptive at another and vice versa. My recent publication in the Journal of Environmental Policy and Management found that leading professionals in New York could define and distinguish by and between the concepts of adaptation, mitigation, and coping, but their facility for identifying and matching the meanings and applications of resilience were statistically random. This suggests the prevalence of rhetoric, which is biased towards the recovery to the status quo and not the requisite functions of resilience and adaptation. In our ongoing deliberations at the American Institute of Architects, this uncertainty has manifested to challenge many conventions of practice. As such, the built environment professions have three fundamental challenges in addressing extreme weather and climate change. First is the uncertainty as a matter of agency. Does one build to the minimum standard of the code, or does one advance resilient designs that may newer, may newer not only to the benefit of the client, but to the block, the neighborhood, and the community and beyond? If one has ever seen the destructive power of a floating porch, I can assure you that these considerations extend well beyond any given property line. This challenge begs the question as to what are the appropriate spatial and legal boundaries as to one's professional as well as ethical responsibilities. Second, assuming that one extends their ethical construction of a practice beyond the immediacy of the client and the code, what are the professional liabilities for such practice? The standard and duty of care is highly subjective and is ultimately based on local practice. The types of experimentation necessary in material and in designs is generally not rewarded by insurance carriers or building code officials. However, in practical terms, for market share, architects are eager to engage climate change because they don't want to give up any more ground to engineers than they necessarily have to. In conceptual terms, however, the value creation exercises of architecture are critical for offsetting the costs of resilience and adaptation. The final critical challenge to professional development is the uncertainty of the standards and metrics from which resilient and adaptive designs can be benchmarked. Our recent research for the International Code Council suggests that less than 200 building codes relating to climate change have been incorporated and implemented in the United States, with about a quarter of those in New York City alone. By contrast, Canada has implemented, or is in the process of implementing, over 6,000 building code changes. Of course, codes are one thing, but the aggregation of experience is another. 
To this end, there is not yet a well-articulated taxonomy of practice. As a very practical matter, the occurrence of any given risk is a function of probability. This probability is then translated into a standard deviation that speaks to expected values and future values of the costs and material and labor, as well as the associated benefits that are designated to serve resilient and adaptive ends. Therefore, uncertainty, or precisely certainty, as expressed in terms of probability, is a major missing piece of the design and development equation. The flip side of this is entirely qualitative. What are the social and environmental benefits for investing in resilience? Together, these questions lead to a fundamental proposition in climate economics. Who pays and who benefits? Given this uncertainty of costs and benefits, how can architects and planners advise clients to make decisions when the information is less than complete and less than certain? At what point does judgment give way to either, to either ethical or professional liability? Is it reasonable to envision that tops down, that is rather, is it reasonable to envision that downscaling of climate science will either enable informed risk-adjusted practices in the future? To guide us in thinking through the implications and limitations given, greater, given the greater application of climate science and decision making is Dr. Radley Horton. There are a few scientists in the U.S. who can speak with such fluency in science and policy from the global to the local. As a research scientist at NASA and at Columbia, Radley's many contributions defy the time allocated here today for a proper introduction. However, I hope that he will bring some clarity to where uncertainty in decision making intersects between science and design. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in the limited time I have here, I thought uh, in the context of, of COP going on at Paris right now that I'd talk a little bit first um, about some of the changes we've observed in climate and some of the climate impacts we've already observed with essentially one degree um, Celsius of, of warming since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And then in the remaining time, um, talk a little bit about the big uncertainties going forward. What are some of the things that we know? Um, and what are some of the potential surprises that we may or may not um, uh, want to start planning for um, as we start to think about some of the other parts of the discussion that are so critical, including how comfortable we are with risk. Um, and then I think uh, hopefully we'll have time to, uh, in the discussion, get into some, some additional ideas that I'll, that I'll posit quickly at, at the end. Okay, so, so sort of jumping to the, the conclusions here, what is maybe some straw persons that we could circle back to maybe in the discussion. Um, you know, my perspective is that, you know, we can't really wait for um, scientific uncertainty to be reduced. Um, as we've seen climate models um, increase in resolution over the years, as our physical understanding has grown, um, in general, um, some of the most basic fundamental climate questions, um, our understanding, for example, of how much global warming we might get for a given increase in greenhouse gases, those uncertainties haven't really narrowed. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we, we can't really wait for the science or expect the science to lead uh, to any narrowing of those numbers. And I think also, you know, th thought about another way, there are, there are a lot of actions that make sense in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reduction and adaptation uh, today. We don't need to wait uh, for more science to, to have a strong case uh, for action. And I guess an extension of that idea is, you know, given the large vulnerabilities that we have right now to existing climate hazards, um, there's a strong case that even if we sort of get lucky in the future, um, if we don't see some of the worst uh, climate projections, nevertheless, we're going to see very large changes in the frequency of occurrence of, of some types of extremes, like coastal flooding, uh, high temperatures. Um, even, if we, even if we don't see uh, that much uh, global warming going forward. So that's, of course, can be a strong argument for action, too. Uh, and I think it is important to emphasize that we don't appear to be on track um, for meeting even a two degree Celsius uh, target. And then I guess the final point that I sort of want to get at, maybe some in the discussion, is I, I'm finding myself, for a while I've been thinking about sort of the danger of false precision when we think about um, projected warming in a specific place. Um, there is strong temptation to downscale. We can talk about some of the limitations of downscaling. Um, but what I'm thinking more and more about is, is also the idea that even if we could miraculously sort of get the perfect climate projections for our um, location, 
I think it's becoming clear and clear, and I, and I gather this came up in some of the talks this morning, um, how, how sort of interdependent our risks are and how for a lot of the decisions that you all will be making, um, climate changes in other regions um, could indirectly have big impacts uh, uh, locally. Um, it's sometimes directly sort of through a climate variable, so this could be sea level rise um, uh, leading to more flooding in other regions, which has impacts on coastal real estate values or flood insurance programs. Or in some cases, these in, in impacts might be, might be more indirect. They might be through changes in ecosystems, uh, public health, um, for example. So I guess there, from my perspective, there are multiple reasons why um, we shouldn't necessarily be focusing all our energies or even a large percentage of our energies on trying to get more precise um, uh, climate projections at the local scale. Okay, so sort of on that first point, what has the sort of first degree Celsius of warming um, since the start of the Industrial Revolution uh, meant, meant for us? It's been about a 40% increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, in that time. Uh, so let's see, is that a pointer? Yeah, okay. So what you're seeing here on the left is area of sea ice in the Arctic. This is just a particular day um, in August 2015. The magenta color is showing if you averaged essentially over the uh, recent 30 year period where you'd expect uh, that sea ice extent to be, and then the, the white is the actual extent on that date in August. So one you know, particular date, one particular year, if you're talking about area, has a big random element uh, due to natural variability. But if we look over here at this plot on the right, which is a little hard to follow, but I, but I think it's important, so let, let's take a minute on it. This is showing volume of sea ice in the Arctic. So volume, of course, is area times thickness. This is a quantity that has less sort of random variability. It takes a lot of energy uh, to change the actual amount, the volume of ice um, in the Arctic. So what are we looking at here? Um, each of these colors is showing you a different month of the year. September is the month where we tend to have the least uh, sea ice in the Arctic, so we can focus there. That's the black color. Okay, so we're basically gonna go around in a circle. We're gonna start from 1979 and make our way around to 2012. If, you, if, you see, if, you're, if you're out here, so we see when we started at 1979, that was roughly the volume of, of sea ice in the Arctic. As we made our way through the next 33 years down to this minimum in 2012, we saw about a 75% um, uh, reduction in the volume of sea ice in the Arctic. Much more than any climate models um, had predicted. Climate models can't capture features. There's nothing in the climate models to suggest the types of feedbacks that you need to see such a large reduction. Now, since that time, there's been a little bit of an increase in volume, sort of back to, you know, now maybe we're down 65% or something. Um, but this is a much bigger change than climate models um, would have suggested uh, was possible. Um, so I think you know, this, is, this is a nice example of uh, how one degree matters. And as we think about these projections for the future and sort of a best case scenario of two degrees Celsius, you know, it suggests the potential for, uh, at least for some parts of the year, an ice-free um, Arctic. And if that happens, all bets are off. None of the climate model projections that we're looking at um, really factor in a situation where you could have an ice-free Arctic in the summer. If that comes to play, when we look at these projections of the future, um, to the point that Adam made earlier, we're gonna be undersampling the range of possible outcomes. Um, and it's important to say that there are some caveats here. It's, it's possible that some of um, this, this decrease is due to natural variability. It's possible that some of it's due to air pollution and soot that aren't captured well in climate models. But bottom line, this is a huge, it takes a huge amount of energy to make a change like this, and climate models don't reproduce that types of feature. So that's sort of esoteric in a way, um, not, not necessarily real clear to us what that, what that means for our system. Let's turn to a couple other examples that maybe hit um, a, little bit, a little bit closer to home. So here's just sort of the basic idea, um, schematic of how a shift in average conditions, if we think of this as just daily temperature, very high daily temperatures here, very low daily temperatures here, it's common, for example, to, for New York City to have uh, days where temperatures are 50 or 60 degrees. That's a high probability on the y-axis. Rare to get these really cold days or these really hot days. Now, if we don't change the variance at all, the variability of that, of that daily data, if we just shift the average conditions, um, if we just have a little bit of warming, that alone can lead to a big change in the probability of, for example, um, a really hot day. 
It's also possible that the variability could change um, too. So now, again, we've had one degree Celsius of global warming. Now here we're gonna look at the frequency of record-breaking extreme hot days in the red and extreme cold days um, in the blue. And again, there can be a lot of natural variability from one decade to another. Um, but if we look at this ratio here, if we go back to the 1950s, it's essentially about a one-to-one -one ratio. And at times into the 70s and 80s, you were actually seeing more record-breaking cold days than record-breaking warm days. By the time we got to the 2000s, we were seeing more than twice as, it was twice as common to have a record-breaking hot day as it was to have a record-breaking cold day. Again, just one degree Celsius of, of global warming dramatically shifted these statistics. Could be some natural variability in there, but you see patterns like this when you look at other parts of the, of the globe too. So one degree Celsius matters. Um, and then a final example um, in the context of coastal flooding. So this schematic is just showing some of the ways that you can get you know, high water at a coastal location. We have the normal um, tidal cycle, and then we have, say, a, a hurricane coming in with a 15-foot surge, waves on top of all that, which we might ignore for the moment. Um, so if your storm happens to hit it at high tide, as Sandy did for much of, of lower Manhattan, um, you can get a worse surge than the storm itself would bring about. Now, of course, sea level rise is another factor in here which can pull that water higher. And the estimates are, for the case of, of Hurricane Sandy, that the foot of sea level rise that New York City had seen since late in the 19th century meant that the region, sort of New York, New Jersey region, had about 70 additional square kilometers flooded and about 80,000 people uh, had their homes take on at least a little bit of water who wouldn't have otherwise if that baseline had been a foot lower. Now we have to say for the Northeast, not all of that foot of sea level rise is, is due to climate change. Roughly a third of it, maybe a little more, is natural variability. But the majority of that is the higher sea level associated with increasing greenhouse gases. And again, that one degree Celsius of warming. So these are some of the ways that even with one degree of warming, um, you know, we're already seeing, uh, seeing some big impacts as, as we start to now shift and, and think a little bit about, uh, about the future. So thinking about, um, about the future, I wanted to take a minute to talk about, about momentum. This is part of why, even if we somehow miraculously, you know, reduce our emissions, um, there is a lot of additional change uh, baked into the system. So if we could somehow stop temperatures uh, from warming tomorrow, we'd still see, as I think Adam alluded to, more sea level rise because the ice sheets, to some extent, we're not sure exactly how much, have been undermined um, by the warming that's gone on today. We're seeing physical motion of the ice sheets um, towards the water to some extent in a way that, again, models didn't predict. Um, it's really in the last five or 10 years as we've observed a lot of these processes that we're beginning to understand some of the time lags in the system. We still haven't seen the ice sheets um, sort of show their hand in terms of how much uh, movement and how much sea level rise we're gonna get just based on the warming that we've had so far. Um, and even if um, we, so, so okay, so um, if we could somehow uh, stop greenhouse gas emissions from rising further, we'd still see temperatures going up, right? Because the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are gonna last there for 100 years or more in a lot of cases. Um, so even if we could somehow sort of get a handle on those emissions right away, there is more warming uh, baked into the system. And finally, you know, to some extent, greenhouse gas emissions um, are bound to keep rising, um, partly due to the infrastructure that's in place, right, the coal plants that have been built, um, a lot of the societal decisions about how we live, things that I'm sure a lot of you have been, been talking about today, to some extent, you know, lock us into more greenhouse gas emissions, even under that sort of best case scenario. And I, you know, put in this other caveat here because the further we push the climate system, the more we increase greenhouse gases, the more warming that we see, the bigger the risk that we become less and less the sort of driving forces for greenhouse gas concentrations. Um, you know, to what extent, as we cause more warming, does permafrost melting become a little bit bigger story in terms of causing further warming? You, you start to get into some, some feedbacks like that that we have to, to think about. Um, okay, so as we move out into the future, as, as Adam mentioned earlier, there are a lot of sources of this, of this deep uncertainty. There are a lot of reasons that it's hard for us to project um, exactly what's gonna happen to the climate. Adam mentioned uncertainty about greenhouse gas concentrations. It's also uncertainty about aerosols in the atmosphere that, that impact uh, climate. Uh, Adam also showed with the color bars um, 
the uncertainty about, about how sensitive the climate system is going to be. Different models give a different amount of warming for a certain increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And at the regional scale, there are also differences too, how precipitation patterns are going to change, temperature patterns. Um, there are also uncertainties at finer uh, spatial and temporal scale. So this is where we get into a lot of the issues um, around downscaling of climate models. So the best climate models today, basically because of the complex processes that they're attempting to document, um, are not able to go to a finer spatial resolution roughly than about 100 kilometers, uh, roughly speaking. A lot of what we care about happens on a much finer um, spatial scale. Um, but before we rush to downscaling, we need to ask a couple questions. One, is there reason to think that the amount of change in the future would be very different in one location than another? You might have two towns that are 20 miles from each other with very different baseline climate, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the pattern of projected warming in the future will differ dramatically um, in those two places. Um, so, there, so, so there's, there's, there's uncertainty on the local scales. For some issues, coastal sea breezes, for example, areas where the, the snow cover might change with sort of fine topography, where you probably really do want to, to get at some of that downscaling if data if you can get it. But in a lot of ways, I think these three uncertainties are really sort of the easiest ones um, when we start to ask how ecosystems might respond uh, to these climate changes, how vector-borne diseases might respond, um, some of the economic implications, perception of risk along the coast. Um, you know, I, I think those in some ways are, are, are more challenging um, uncertainties. I think in the interest of time, I'll skip through uh, going into more detail about some of the feedbacks uh, and, uh, that can that can determine just how much warming um, we're going to get. So a couple of um, specific applications uh, where we can see these big uncertainty uh, bounds. The projections that we've developed for New York City uh, show a range of possible warming, um, even just a sort of central range, four to six degrees by the 2050s. If we hone in on this example of sea level rise, let's look at this case of uh, projected sea level rise by the 2050s. We came up with a most likely range of one and a half feet to two and a half feet. Um, if we look at that range of projections and assume that hurricanes and nor'easters stay the same in the future and just ask what would that sea level rise alone do to the frequency of coastal flooding, we see a big range of possible outcomes. Um, by the 2050s, the, what's currently the one in a hundred year flood that happens 1% in 1% of years, um, if we have that uh, 18 inches of sea level rise, uh, we'd expect that to happen 50% more often or so. But if we see this scenario of two and a half feet of sea level rise, that one in 100 year coastal flood event becomes a one in 20 year event. That two and a half feet of sea level rise, if you feel like that's an extreme scenario for the 2050s, well, if we shift our time scale to the 2080s, that's a very middle of the road uh, projection for how much sea level rise we might have by then. And again, we haven't invo invoked stronger hurricanes. So it's, it's really another part of this argument that small shifts in the average can have big impact on the frequency of extremes, and also, of course, the area that's flooded or the magnitude of an extreme when it happens. So seen here is the current one in 100 year uh, coastal flood in the purple, and then under these different sea level rise scenarios, including an extreme one of six feet by 2100, all of these additional areas um, being flooded by today's uh, one in 100 year uh, storm. Okay, I think I don't have much time to get into joint hazards. I wanted to talk a little bit about this sort of balance in planning of the hazards that we sort of know about, things like days over 90 degrees that have happened in the past that could happen two or three times as often in the future. Um, arguably, it's easier to prepare for, for that type of hazard than some emergent possibilities. Um, and one thing we're doing a lot of work on now is combined effects of high temperatures and high humidity. Jesse and I have been talking a little bit about some of the challenges that that could pose in a lot of parts of the world. Um, the huge increased demand for air conditioning that you'll see um, as more and more places start experiencing these temperatures and humidity levels that really a person can't survive and, and, and function for long outdoors. And um, you basically end up in a situation where your air conditioning systems can't fail um, so there are a lot of interesting issues around there. And there may also, on the technical side, I gather, uh, be, be some issues about the performance and efficiency um, of those air conditioning units when humidity um, is really high. So that's a, a possible thing we could, could explore more. We've been looking a lot at joint hazards. I, what I talked about before was impacts of sea level rise alone. What happens if we don't just look at sea level rise and how storms might change, but what if we also look at shared risk? Are there 
physical processes, changes in the temperatures of the upper ocean, for example, that could both lead to higher sea level rise and stronger storms. Um, when, we do, when we look at those joint hazards together, some of the climate models suggest those two risks could be correlated, higher sea level rise, more frequent coastal flooding. Put it together, and if you really care about that high tail outcome, that worst case scenario, um, you may need to think about a, a, a worse options than you've been thinking about um, before. So I don't have time to run through the heat stress um, work that I mentioned earlier. Bottom line, as you start to get up to what's called a wet bulb temperature, temperature and humidity together of 35 Celsius, you're really at the limit of what even the most fit people can, can, can handle uh, outside. And as we look at the future, uh, what you're seeing here is how often um, by the 2060s, the high wet bulb temperature that happens once a year today, the, the once per year, is occurring in the future. By the time we get out to the 2060s, a lot of parts of the southeast here are seeing close to a hundredfold increase. Don't worry at all about the precise numbers here. We have nowhere near that level of precision. The point is, more than an order of magnitude uh, increase seems likely. And then what might the actual highest wet bulb temperatures be once per year in the 2060s, framing it a little different way. We see very populous areas um, of northern India, Nepal, into much of northeastern China, on average once per year seeing wet bulb temperatures in the 32 Celsius ballpark, um, which we can really count on um, uh, posing a real challenge. If we look at once per decade, temperatures starting to get close to that 35 Celsius threshold. So I think this is an underestimated um, risk uh, going forward. And then the key findings from the study, um, I, I sort of already, already talked about most of those. Okay, so circling back, these are the key points I mentioned earlier. Um, as we're thinking about you know, some of the exciting areas um, of work going forward, I think there's a lot more to do exploring different types of joint hazards, trying to build in the impacts of heavy rain events, which often happen at the same time we're having storm surges. Um, it wasn't necessarily a sandy case, but that's often the case when we're having a coastal storm. Sea level rise will add a potential nonlinearities there for sure. Um, I talked a little bit about physical correlations, uh, sea level rise, for example, with uh, a hurricane. Uh, there are also issues we'd want to think about a temporal and spatial correlation. Are we going to get into patterns where you're more likely to have a sequence of different types of extremes? Um, are we get into patterns where we see different parts of the world experiencing extreme heat waves, droughts at the same time across, for example, some of the breadbasket uh, regions. Or maybe not, maybe we'll find anti-correlation, but there are potential um, surprises that argue for the need to look for kind of spatial and temporal structure um, in these types of extremes. Uh, as I think we'll hear a little bit in some of the upcoming talks about uh, adaptation strategies that are underway, as we're thinking about ways to evaluate some of those strategies, how can we um, deal with the fact that there's large natural variability in the occurrence of extremes? You might go a decade without experiencing a once per year coastal flood, that's possible. You might also just due to bad luck alone get two one in a hundred year floods um, in the next you know, three or four years, independent of anything to do with climate change. Are there any ways that as we're designing structures to protect against floods, um, we can sort of build in that, that, that type of understanding? Um, I think you know, the last point, sort of along similar lines, is, is the importance of integrating the stakeholder scientist collaborations. I think there's so much of the, the sort of key work that's going on in this, in this space is engineering, design, uh, science, as we're, as we're building new green spaces. Um, a lot of the key information is coming in from the people who are building these things. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as scientists, it's really exciting to be, to be able to sort of work in the Northeast where we're seeing so many more, so many uh, innovative uh, design strategies uh, underway. Okay, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, next up is Professor Adrian LaHood, um, the head of architecture at the Royal College of Art uh, in London. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Amal. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I want to begin with a case study on climate change um, and then conclude with something more speculatively related to architecture. So the first section of this um, is really about two kinds of bodies and the kinds of sympathy that they find with each other. 
atmospheric particles floating through the sky, human beings moving across the ground and then along the sea, and I want to try to describe their contact. Each body sets the other into motion, a kind of movement and counter movement. The particle bodies from north to south, the human bodies from south to north. Now the difference in the kinds of bodies is given in the models used to grasp their character. On one side, the physical chemical explanations used to make models of the climate system, and on the other, the anthropological, psychological explanations used to make models of the human character. So the contact between these bodies is, in an important way, the contact between these different kinds of models. And the consequences for this contact make for the story I'm going to tell you. So let's take a global climate model, which is really a kind of series of sub-models which are refined until they capture the causal structure of the problem to be reproduced. And the trick is to somehow reproduce enough information to catch what is relevant in the problem, no more, no less. And a working model of causality is really just a reliable explanation of a problem that is in some way formalized. And one way to think about scale here is to try to imagine a mesh whose apertures must be tuned to catch elements of just the right size. Do we calibrate it to catch the weather pattern, the cloud formation, or the water droplet? Well, it depends on what you want to explain. Scale is what organizes the relationship between the problem and the model. Now, one difficulty is that histories of explanation and representation solidify around historical problems, meaning that we inherit conventions in knowledge production that struggle to capture what is salient in new kinds of problems. Especially when these new kinds of problems bring together the large and the small, the near and the far, the fast and the slow, the weak and the strong, as we've heard about today, making a mess of our conventions as they now do. Consider the importance of scale in climate science, of which we've seen some wonderful examples, in which signs must be extracted from a vast sea of scalar variability. Consider that this sea of cycles and oscillations span from the nanosecond quick flicker of infrared to the half million year passage of our astronomical seasons with all of the endless flux in between. And climate science has to extract individual rhythms from this cacophony. It has to work out what makes a rhythm switch tempo, play more insistently with more syncopation or just plain out of time. And though obviously they set out to explain different kinds of things to climate models, we find something similar when we look at models of human subjectivity. So here the aim has always been to use the signs of external conduct to construct a model of internal motivation to understand the way that conduct emerges out of natural dispositions or, as Michelle Fair has beautifully put it recently, according to a schema of conflict between good and bad propensities such as charity and greed, passion and reason, shame and self-worth. Models of subjectivity are supposed to explain what causes human beings to behave the way that they do. And so in the following, I want to sketch out very quickly what happens when environmental models intercept models of human character. So the paradigm of desertification reverts to the idea that indigenous factors caused severe drought in the Sahel from the 1970s to the 1980s. And the theory went as follows. Poor land use was leading to a loss of soil and vegetation. More importantly, it was claimed that the indigenous mismanagement of land was changing the reflectivity of the Earth's surface, resulting in less rain. The people of the Sahel had become weather makers of the most self-destructive kind. So here we have two kinds of models, say a generic explanation of people, and indeed the literature from the period refers to the farmer's inability to reason, to plan, to calculate properly, that is to their irrationality, but also to their inflexibility, that is to a special lack of capacity to adapt their actions to changing circumstances, and also an explanation of the behavior of the environment with respect to their actions, irreversible damage to the surface, triggering positive feedback in the atmosphere. And the intersection of these two models gives us a specific geopolitical paradigm, man-made desertification. And so the consequence of this paradigm were a disastrous legacy of ill-conceived aid packages, reforms, and interventions. In the last decade, however, climate science has finally confirmed a saying of the Zagawa people in Chad who described the expansion of the Sahara like this. So it was the severity of the Sahelian drought that made it the perfect object to, to train generations of climate models upon. What follows is a fascinating scientific detective story suggesting that the oceans were driving the drying of the Sahel. The first clue was that models that correlated ocean temperature to precipitation, the heat in the ocean was acting like a pacemaker for the monsoon. But something was missing. The models could reproduce the signal, but not its strength. Something else was driving the ocean temperature. Was it global warming? And so this is where things become more difficult. Scientists found 
what scientists found was that drying depended on a balance between two forces. The first was the temperature between cold, the temperature difference between cold and warm water in the tropics. The second was the temperature of the troposphere. Instability in the first would tend to more rain, stability in the second would tend to more drying. The victor would drive precipitation patterns. The balance of power was poised. Until an unlikely protagonist tips the scales, as if in homage to Lucretius, fate would be decided by the infinitesimal swerve of a particle. So most people associate global warming with CO2, but fossil fuels produce another byproduct, aerosols. For some time, science has been aware that European and American aerosol emissions were changing the temperature of the oceans. The hypothesis that formed was that this was weakening the temperature gradient that was so crucial to precipitation patterns. Aerosol particles are unlike CO2. CO2 is long-lived and disperses evenly, which is why we can talk about PPM as a global concentration. Aerosol particles are short-lived, they get lifted up in air currents, carried through the atmosphere, and then deposited. Their effects are far more localized. Finally, all CO2 molecules are identical, but every single aerosol particle is individual. This character is what makes them so intractable scientifically, but also so suggestive politically. Individuality is what allows science to identify the source of the particle. Like a fingerprint on a crime scene or a tracer in the atmospheric bloodstream, aerosols tell us a great deal about the structure of the great aerial oceans and the way that their currents redistribute the consequences of human and non-human actions. For example, aerosol deposition in the Amazon tells us that, astonishingly, a small dried out lake bed named Baudelaire in Chad has been secretly supplying the rainforest with nutrients for years. Saharan dust, carried thousands of kilometers over the Atlantic, has been fertilizing an Amazonian garden. In the case of the Sahel, it does something less metaphysically, but more politically suggestive. So, is aerosol dispersion caused by European and North American industrialization significantly contributing to a drying in the Sahel? Well, we don't really know. But pause to consider the kind of question being posed, because it's a very unusual kind of question. It's not what is the acceptable average temperature? It's not what is the global concentration of CO2? It's not a we are in it together kind of question because it's not posed at the scale of the planet or the globe. It suggests that actions in one limited part of the world affect actions in another limited part of the world, even over great distances. And it's a different kind of question because it's posed at the scale of specific people and their fate, which is the scale of lived histories, not their negation into a universal humanity. And therefore, it's a paradigm of a differently scaled politics. So as the model of the environment changed, so did the models used to understand human behavior. The first was to recognize the incredible cultural and linguistic diversity of the region. The second was to recognize the diversity of forms of life. For example, according to a gradient of sedentary and nomadic life, where east to west differences give you similar territorial practices but different clans, and north to south differences give you different territorial practices and ethnic markers. Then to look at the same diagram from the perspective of the herders and what you get is a kind of checkerboard trying to show a, a kind of nomadic opportunism, which is you know, to use pastoral routes that avoid the farms. Not only this, but there is an understanding that what we sometimes take to be a kind of essentialist ethnic marker is usually a marker of activity. So you can be an Arab by being a nomadic pastoralist. And indeed, there's a certain pragmatic fluidity, but also a precarious tension between these livelihoods that is exacerbated under environmental duress. Lastly, there's an awareness of indigenous environmental concepts. For example, the absence of statistical forms of reasoning about precipitation, and in their place, something more like a qualitative rather than a quantitative model. And together, they radically invert the previous concept of the Sahelian farmer, plagued by irrationalities and a kind of stubborn, ancient inflexibility towards something like its opposite. And though the intersection of these different models is starting to have better outcomes, the area remains caught in a situation not of its own making. Social stress is still being exacerbated by non-local non environmental factors, and a great diasporic movement of people is still heading to the major cities on the West African coast and north towards Europe and the Mediterranean. So the southward trajectory of aerosols and their effect on the climate of the Sahel and the northward 
trajectory of migrants attempting to flee sub-Saharan Africa and enter into Europe is a kind of geometry around which this talk is being organized. What gets emitted as a particle returns as a refugee. What is received as a refugee gets returned as a particle, this movement and counter movement. In this drama, uh, Edmund Lockhart's principle that every contact leaves us trace, the very cornerstone of modern forensics, uh, still applies, but with a complicated catch. The contact and the trace drift apart. Environments loosen the bonds between cause and effect, obscuring the link between attribution, responsibility, and potentially justice. But what does justice mean here? During the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Conference, the public debate was framed by two simple questions. Would an accord be signed or not? And what would be an acceptable average temperature increase? Would it be 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, 2.5 degrees? Unbeknownst to the G77, a group of developing nations, the Danish had been circulating a secret text proposing a two degree global average temperature increase exclusively amongst the G20. No. I don't think we've got time to watch the video. Um, when this was discovered, the Sudanese diplomat representing the G77, Lumumba de Arping, called an impromptu press conference and made the following comments. And if you're interested, you can see the video on YouTube. Um, and he says, we've been asked to sign a suicide pact. He calls it a colonization of the sky. And then finally, he says the words climate genocide. The proposed average of two degrees meant 3.5 degrees in many of the nations that de Arping represented, a kind of catastrophic result for sub-Saharan Africa. De Upping's claim was an attempt to re-establish the proper political scale within a debate about temperature increase in order to prevent specific populations being effaced by the coarseness of the model. And that's what's at stake in scale. The conference was a failure. Um, what it revealed, however, was a certain calculus of life and death concealed in every model. So if images belong to a kind of evidentiary paradigm and a symptomatology of signs, then perhaps models belong to a speculative paradigm, a kind of etiology of causes. The model is an observation and a hypothesis. It's a data and a kind of claim. But insofar as the model is the means by which scenarios be, can become rehearsed, it's more than a representation of possible futures. They become a medium through which the present produces the future, through which the present produces the future somewhat speculatively. COP sits at the summit of a vast collective scientific endeavor, but the evidentiary paradigm which forms its foundation presupposes too much to start with, a kind of good faith in the forum, in the way understanding flows from visibility, in the way political change flows from understanding. It presupposes a common regime of intelligibility, shared stakes, institutions, and protocols. In other words, it presupposes so much of what the world lacks. So where does this leave architecture and design? Well, the way that models of the environment intercept models of human subjectivity is a crucial area of inquiry. And what I'm proposing is that we need to find a way to think these two things together. But in light of the failures of COP, can we imagine a kind of intersection that doesn't presuppose as much faith in the functioning of the forum, that doesn't presuppose a common regime of intelligibility, but instead starts with a proposition that embodies a kind of original asymmetry? <coughs> so let's conclude with a very quick thought experiment in order to return to the question of design, but hopefully in a new way. Um, by introducing a incredible text by the anthropologist Alfred Jell and two figures, the hunter and the trapper. So if the hunter stands for the paradigm of discursive power, this evidentiary regime of signs, we know evidence always requires an interlocutor, the hunter, who is sensitized to signs. It requires a figure able to reconstruct a spatial and historical explanation from the series. And the hunter is the first to narrate an event. Finally, this narration requires a forum like this one today, in which the story can be retold. And of course, Nimrod, the biblical figure of the hunter, as we know, is responsible for the tower bound up in the origin of language. The power of the hunter is an explanatory power, grounded in the interpretation of signs within a space of shared intelligibility. And this is the first paradigm that I've just taken you through with this example from climate science. So the second figure I want to introduce is the trapper. Vogel's net is really an extended thought experiment in which Alfred Jell mounts an imaginary <coughs> exhibition of animal traps. The reason for my interest in Jell's work on traps is that I think that they embody what I want to call an asymmetry of legibility. At the very least, 
the trap is an object that works best when it's unintelligible to its subject. At most, the trap embodies something absolutely essential, which is a kind of fundamental inequality between beings. To work well, the predator must understand the behavior of the prey. The most successful trapper is the one who is closest to the animal itself. The trapper who grasps the behavior of the prey in all the dimensions of its character makes a device which embodies the concept of his character. The trap rarely embodies the form of the prey, though humorously, sometimes it does, as in the giraffe trap. More often, it embodies something essential in the prey's character, such as the propensity of the rat to borrow. We can also say that the trap expresses the ambition of the predator. And therefore, perhaps like a, the previous examples, the trap is an object, a designed object, where the character of the prey intersects with the intention of the predator. And I'll let you read this. So the chimpanzee trap, for example, solicits the natural curiosity and intelligence of primates. It preys on the primate's ability to balance its instinct with this intelligence. A small thread in the example on the screen has captured something essential in the character of its subject better than any image. The animal trap turns the personality of the animal against it. That is why, animal, this is why traps always have a tragic dimension. And if you are trained to look at architectural or environmental traps, you might be able to extract a kind of portrait of the character of the prey. Or more precisely, you would extract a portrait of the point of intersection where the character of the prey and the intention of the predator meet. In architecture, however, power never touches the human directly. Instead, it addresses the human through the life world in which the human subject exists as a set of alternative conflicting potentials. Environmental determinism would suggest a direct correspondence between the climate or geography and the character of the human being, as if an unbroken line of causality chained the human character to the strength of the sun. But in environments, we never find lines of causality without fields of uncertainty. But this uncertainty is not only what tempers the strength of our predictions or what qualifies the veracity of our claims, it is the terrain of political struggle itself. Architecture's role in this struggle might be to contribute a particularly uncertain kind of trap, lacking in virtue and good faith, patient, malevolent, living and residing in our blind spot, the amoral, anti-enlightenment object par excellence. Thank you. And finally, Professor Kate Orff, who's Director of Urban Design here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I thought my, the clearest way that I could contribute to this day with so many amazing speakers is just to give a very concrete example from a practitioner standpoint of a project in which we were aiming to design for uncertainty. Um, and, and so it's a, a kind of an applied intervention, if you will, um, in our region, in the New York region. These are the main points that I would like to make today. One is that um, design for climate change means that we have to think about infrastructure in a new way, uh, in a way that is not sort of solving for a singular problem, but that is multi-purpose and is multivalent, that has social and ecological benefits, in addition to solving specific problems, maybe this sort of paradigm of civil engineering of the last century. Second, that designing for climate change will involve new collaborations and sort of synthetic work processes um, between that, that, that engage um, scientists, designers, engineers, and sociologists, or I use this loosely, but like there's some, there's some discipline that doesn't exist yet, which is about how fostering of, of, of social cohesion. And then finally, that um, designers um, and, and scientists can sort of expand our own methodologies and find a kind of much more common working ground where where, as, as we learned from Radley, that you know, climate change is already baked in to the system. So let's start now. Let's try to define new working methodologies um, starting, starting today. So, but of course, you know, climate is also defined very much as risk. And I feel like with this group, and certainly in Adrian's remarks, that we can challenge this word of risk. You could call it preparedness, et cetera. 
But in this project, which is called Living Breakwaters, that I'm going to show, um, we first developed a sort of design concept or a working sort of design methodology by just trying to define what is at risk in the New York region. And this was after Hurricane Irene, which is very kind of water heavy event, and then Sandy, which was um, a sort of high surge event, um, and trying to understand the multivariate effects of, of these kinds of events um, in New York relative to uncertainty, right? Um, and so often, you know, this sort of, the Dutch, you know, have been often held up as this example of, of designing for climate change. But the reality is, is that, you know, in the past, it's just been about, in, in Holland, building higher and higher uh, levees and so on. Um, but, you know, this sort of innovation now is really thinking about living with water, designing with water. And then in our context, that, that sort of, you know, environmental, um, you know, approach doesn't really apply because we have this incredibly high degree of variability and uncertainty and potential risk. So on top of our sea level rise, which even from Professor Girard this morning, you know, we know that New York State is now asking us to look at over um, uh, six feet over 100 uh, years, uh, uh, potentially, of, of rise. We also have incredible and potentially increased variability and um, frequency of, of events like hurricanes and surge. So this hatched zone is, in, is expanding. So in this process, um, we began to really study um, our environmental and ecological regional context and began to focus on what I see as de facto infrastructure, uh, which is our sort of regional bay landscapes and estuaries. You can kind of see the signature of the geo, well, first you can see the geomorphology of the New York Bight kind of funneling in um, wind and, and wave action into the central harbor, but then you can also see sort of chain of barrier islands and bays that in effect provide this um, um, de facto um, uh, uh, attenuation of wave action and surge. So we felt, let's start there. I mean, in fact, New York's robust ecological context was one of the many reasons why it thrived economically and so on. So we began by taking a kind of an inventory of existing landscape typologies or shallow water ecosystems and um, from you know, low salt marshes to dunes to subtidal reefs and barrier islands and began to think of layer, layering them up and, and trying to understand, test, and model how they perform uh, for risk reduction at a landscape scale. And I am a landscape architect by training, so for me, landscape as a scale has been incredibly useful because I see it as a zone of, that is, um, defines an area that is potentially implementable, um, but also that one can sort of scale up to larger regional questions from, and also can scale down to smaller units of community and smaller units of sort of individual participation. So landscape scale has been very useful for me. So, but back to um, multi-purpose infrastructure. So this project, um, Living Breakwaters, that was, uh, was funded um, through, um, it's had received federal funding through um, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development and um, $60 million for construction. And it is located off the, um, the coast of Staten Island. This is the tip of Staten Island. And what is it? It is simply a, a linear chain of ecologically designed breakwaters that reduces wave action. Um, there were uh, two people lost their lives in Tottenville uh, while waves crashed on houses. And it um, is paired with an onshore dune. The breakwaters themselves are seeded with oysters from the Billion Oyster Project, which is an, uh, sort of an oyster gardening project. So we're directly con connecting with schools on shore to sort of cultivate, seed, and, and sort of steward these breakwater structures. And so it's really this kind of notion of, of, of integrating reduced risk, um, onshore um, social resiliency, and also um, uh, the, the, the regeneration, literally, of a shoreline that has been dredged and that has lost its structural habitat. In devising this project, um, we also worked with hydrodynamic modeler, um, doc, Dr. Philip Orton, a graduate of Lamont here, and began to work in an iterative way with GIS um, in his ADSERC and SWAN models to understand how these structures might be placed, where they might be most efficacious, where they exist in plan and section, et cetera. So um, it was a kind of creative oceanography, if you will, a kind of creative way of integrating topographical um, and geographical changes with real-time testing of how these changes perform. <clears throat> 
sort of critical in my own feeling about designing for uncertainty is the concept of a layered approach, where we no longer can think in a monofunctional way, in a monocultural way, about solving for project X, because as we know, um, through these graphs that we're seeing, that we don't even know what X is in, in 50 years, in 100 years. So in my feeling, my, my sort of kind of instinct is that through kind of reintroducing the sort of ecological layers and, and sort of more multi-dimensional um, uh, 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 infrastructure in our immediate context, this sort of thicker, more robust matrix can help us um, respond to and, and, and anticipate unanticipated un, 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 um, uh, events. So even in this section, not only do we layer those different forms of shallow water infrastructure with a reef, an onshore dune, uh, raised houses, etc., but we also layer in sort of social programs. And, and under, with a strong sense of onshore culture and rebuilding onshore culture. So this is essentially the thought process or the kind of thesis of um, designing for resiliency or designing for risk. As you can see, it puts um, onshore culture in the form, in my project at least, in the form of schools and communities in this kind of relationship of sort of permanent engagement. Um, and that the entire point of, of this project is that, you know, we cannot, you know, line our 500 mile plus, you know, shorelines with walls. In fact, um, we do not want to live in this kind of environment, nor is it, you know, uh, safe. Um, but we, we rather need to increase our perception of risk via this sort of permanent sense of engagement with our immediate environment. Um, so this is a cross-section of the project as it is being um, implemented, and I should say right now we're in um, we're environmental impact phase, environment impact statement phase, and it is planned to be built in 20, by 2019, which is actually incredibly fast for uh, this type of project. But you can see how the offshore dune increases sedimentation, thickens the shoreline, um, the onshore dune helps reduce flooding, and then the sort of schools and communities um, um, create this sort of um, uh, situation of constant, um, of a sort of a regenerative landscape. So in a way, even though this project is a physical project, it is an intervention on the shoreline, it is also a political project, it is a sociological project, and it tries to move beyond this notion of a sort of static idea of infrastructure and design toward a more kind of the idea of, of a project or an intervention as something that enables an active, an activist stance, and a sort of um, a, 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 a position of activ activizing um, an urban environment, activizing. So, anyway, in general, it's trying to recode um, this sort of negative into a positive. Oh, good, and um, and uh, reduce risk along the shoreline. Here's a cross section of of the breakwater and um, how it aims to regenerate different um, and thicken the landscape over its length. We have sort of subtitle um, reefs, subtitle reef streets, which I'll explain in a minute. You have a sort of intertidal zone, you have upland zones, and then you have the sort of newly sedimented zone for clams and so on. But the entire kind of point of this project is that how can we kind of shift from this, I don't want to say downward spiral, but this like sense of constantly eroding shorelines, increased risk, um, acidification, and, and the sort of collapse scenarios that, that have been so well documented, and how can you intervene as a designer into a physical place and develop a sort of a regenerative strategy? So in terms of scale, a few notes on literally scale in this particular proposal is that in the breakwater itself, we have these kind of pockets, which we're calling reef streets here. Um, they are designed for um, juvenile fish, for um, fin fish, to be able to kind of have protected pockets, again, of structural habitat where fish can literally feed in the street and the street becomes a kind of a public space for juveniles. Structural habitat, we learned from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, was completely absent in the New York environs. And then even to scale down from the region to the site, to the reef street, even in a smaller sense, um, the actual breakwater units themselves have these like little holes, little uh, pore spaces for juvenile sea bass and fin fish. So um, even at the level of the sort of micro macro surface on the unit itself is something that um, is is sort of aimed. And this is sort of recycled glass that's part of the 
the structure is aimed to sort of recruit biological life. And this surface itself, um, because it's a low pH concrete, also will then, at, you know, at, uh, oysters um, and shellfish will be, be able to very easily attach to this surface. So this is essentially a gardening project um, at the scale of a sort of geography. Um, and importantly, um, the project, because it has this lo like longer term sedimentary effects over time, the goal is that this is also a project about urbanizing the shoreline and, and regenerating habitat, not only for, for animals, but also for people. If anyone knows Staten Island, you know that the shoreline is actually, and this is a major issue with what, what Radley mentioned, um, is that, of course, our public shorelines are now eroding up to private property lines. So this has huge effects and imp um, impacts on the public environs of, of our region. So a couple of quick notes on the sorts of new collaborations that we need. Um, leading up to Breakwater's project, we um, worked with a whole range of uh, folks from uh, the New York Harbor School, to um, um, tr trying to find a, and define a community of marine engineers. Um, this is one of our marine engineers literally walking a transect um, in Great Kills. You need new collaborations um, uh, to understand the science and to be able to translate um, science from something which is an abstract design to criteria to something that becomes an activist and, and design uh, fodder. You need, um, and I think from a planning standpoint, you know, we need to go beyond the sort of check the box EIS mentality, which is like for or against a project, to think about our interventions as in themselves generating of a public, generating of a, a kind of a community that does, maybe does not yet exist. And here's, sorry, this is like a guy wearing an oyster hat next to one of our models. This is a generative problem. And then, you know, I see this, you know, this is a model, our, our firm Scape's model for um, this, um, the Living Breakwaters Project. It was a model that was made in the Staten Island makerspace by community members. And then um, uh, uh, here you can see on the right, and then it kind of traveled to local museums. But even though this is a kind of a, you know, process, you know, fun process, but it is literally a one-to-one -one kind of explanation of how we intend this project to work. It is a project that is about engagement um, as much as anything. It is a project that involves a lot of photo ops. Um, this is a, you know, these kinds of large-scale transformations are, um, are political and um, involve in a lot of detail in terms of even this is a meeting with the Parks Department merit, and, um, and who will be ultimately maintaining these structures. So um, it is a project that involves city, state, and federal uh, actors. So, and then finally, a couple words on expanded methodologies, because this is really where I see GSAP playing a huge role. Um, inside the office, um, and I hear I feel like we can expand the, the, the potential of these sort of shared design science uh, methods. Inside the office, this is how we work to sort of we iterate in model, we test the design. In the case of the breakwaters, we're trying to pilot, modify, implement it by 2019. And then the goal is that this is a, rep a cross section that could be replicated um, and modified as we move forward. So I think I will close there. I'll just fast forward. These are some other projects that we worked on to test, iterate, and model. And um, just to say that this is where the project is now. Um, it has been uh, funded. The, we are doing our geotechnical borings. We are doing our um, samples of our e-concrete in the Raritan Bay. Um, and, you know, and I think a main kind of aspect here we are with our, this is our geotechnical boring ship off the coast of Tottenville. Um, and I think sort of the big, you know, idea here, um, let's see if this works. Can you press one of those videos? Just another kind of note to designers. Let's see if this works. I may have erred in my uploading of my presentation. Sorry. Well, this is a slide that talks about the new kinds of aesthetic, you know, implications that, that there are for architects and designers. Um, that this is a, a sort of, you know, the glassy building is, you know, I wrote one of my first books, or it was a booklet, was with the New York City Audubon Society about Bird, um, in, um, bird strike in New York. And so I never looked at a glass building the same way after that. But I think in the same way, 
that design for climate change has an incredibly different kind of set of aesthetic um, uh, sort of parameters. And, um, but basically, um, um, that's the end of my talk. And I, I guess I just wanted to sort of close with this, you know, this notion of, of what I've tried to show you today is an example of a defined, delimited project that is existing within existing regulatory financial structures um, and uh, existing kind of governmental processes. And so, you know, but with the project, we, we were kind of hoping, even within these existing kind of legal and regulatory frameworks to sort of generate um, a new approach uh, to resiliency. Thanks. So in the exercise of climate planning, um, uh, you, you have a diverse uh, group of stakeholders with different languages, um, different motivations. Um, and, and one of the uh, sort of principal exercises is to, beyond identifying what the risk and vulnerabilities are, what's your sort of, you know, what's the end game, what are the objects? acknowledging that both resilience and adaptation are actually processes and not outcomes, um, is a certain delineation of values. Um, and those values tr are translated in different ways. I think Adrian took on a, um, a narrative uh, of what those values are and an institutional, uh, occult, less of an institutional proposition but more of a cultural aggregation that is translated through narrative. Radley's perspective on some level is an institutionalization, um, and I, I don't want to say qualitative and quantitative to divide the, the card here, but I think what we recognize is there's a limitation to both. Um, so, of course, when you go through this exercise of planning in this regard, you hire someone like Kate, who's actually going to help you weight those values. Because it's one thing to define the values. It's a whole other thing to provide a weighting. Because the weighting is how you prioritize limited resources, right? There's not enough resources to do everything that we want to do. So we have to weight what is, what is right, what is wrong, most for the many, et cetera, et cetera. So Adrian, I'll raise this first question to you. You know, what are the techniques grounded perhaps in social science. Uh, recently, people have been hiring anthropologists to understand certain hierarchies, for instance, within community groups, to really to maximize that level of engagement. What do you think are some of the uh, uh, methodologies in social science, maybe it is the narrative in a way, um, that are most effective engaging this diversity of constituency to get to the end game of weighting these values, whether it's a function of harmonization or consensus? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a social scientist, and I don't think I could probably give you a very adequate answer. But I would f look at the question slightly differently, um, which I think ultimately, maybe what's at stake, ideally, is to get into a situation where people can assign a weighting to things such that they could be negotiated. I think what's also as prevalent, maybe more prevalent, are situations in which the possibility of the weightings um, making things that are incommensurable commensurable, because that's what a weighting does, um, is a far more difficult struggle. And what I want to try to do in the presentation is just to alert us to that moment in which we acknowledge that certain things are incommensurable um, and that the stakes of negotiation within climate change, but within also, you know, design or urban design, certainly within kind of climate activism, um, don't always lend themselves so easily to assigning a kind of weighting to things that are different. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, so sorry, it's not, a, it's not an, an answer, but it's just to sort of say, to flag up the, the idea that the, there is something else at stake here, and, and I think there's, there's really genuine conflicts at stake. 
Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, so another sort of practical execution, day-to-day -day planning. Uh, people tend to focus, shift gears here a little bit because I, I certainly recognize that. And I think that original asymmetry that you highlighted, Adrienne, I think was important because I, that's what it is. There's, there's winners and losers, um, and we really have to recognize what's at stake. And I, I, I think that that, net, that formalization of the problem that you highlighted is key. Um, and, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's the informal in not recognizing the, the true delineations of the problem and letting that have its own evolutionary outcome. But Kate, jumping back, very practical. People design projects, um, they think capital costs, they think tax base, they think, you know, what is the true, you're going to pay for this, there's a paradox. You pay for it as a consumer, you pay for it as a tax paper. It's one or the other, but there's this cost and there's this burden. The question is who shares? But one of the things we often overlook is the operation maintenance that it's the ongoing life cycling of what is being designed. And one of the things I think that struck me about your project is that you had a certain sophistication of how this lives and evolves with the forces of the ocean, with sedimentation, both in positive and negative ways. And I, I asked, you know, when, as a, from a designer, how do you approach that interaction, that uncertainty of where it can advance the maintenance of your, of your project and give, and, and give it a whole new life? Mm -hmm. How do you advance that? Because it could work in the completely opposite way as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. So that it could go in both directions. Right. How do you harness that power as a designer? So, so, so I'm going to try to link the, 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 the response and then the answer with, I just wanted to highlight this word in, in commen, incommensurable because I also feel like um, once you, um, I feel like there is an, a role for designers also in articulating the trade-offs. And when I present this project, I very consciously fall into the mode of trying to get it funded, like using the narrative that I have used to present to the head of HUD and to the governor of New York, et cetera, to, you know, to show, um, you know, a scenario that is um, integrated and that pulls together. Um, but often, you know, I will say, not behind the scenes, because that's too, but, but constantly in, in our own workspace and in our mental kind of conceptualization of the project, it was constantly about um, what it does not do, what the challenges are, how it might fail, what, um, you know, how, in my mind, this is a project that's about reducing risk, but is also, I think, very much a project that's trying to essentially provide a bridge to a future which, in which other problems could be discussed or thought about. You know, I'm not trying to stop the time. I'm not trying to kind of say, okay, now everything's going to be fine after this. In, in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's literally a, a space, uh, literally, for this kind of part of civilization, <laughs> Staten Island, to come to terms with, you know, the map that you showed, which is even with uh, three feet of sea level rise, the shoreline of Staten Island itself is largely uninhabitable. So, so I just wanted to highlight that and how, how much I appreciate your, your remarks in that, in that sense. And so that also pulls forward to this notion of maintenance, you know, and, and operations because it is a time-based project where rather than it existing in one moment in time and needing to be maintained backwards to, to um, uh, maintain it in that state of, of implementation. In fact, through our sort of um, our particle modeling and so on, uh, it is designed to in fact change the shoreline dramatically over 20 years. So if it does, it, it needs to not be maintained in order to be successful. In addition, the, the sort of oyster um, and, and sort of shellfish the calbian, um, uh, calcium carbonate sort of crust the ideas that that would also grow over time and, and help to, to, to sort of uh, mitigate the sort of effects of, of wave action by providing the surface roughness. So it completely changes the idea of maintenance in that, it, in fact, we're kind of playing, trying to put into place a trajectory of change that, um, that is then gardened and not maintained back to some origin. Yeah, please. 
I thought of a better answer. <laughs> um, in fact, it's not my own answer, but someone else's answer to a similar question. Um, it's an anecdote that Viveros de Castro um, recites. It's from Levi Strauss, and he talks about when the conquistadors arrived in the Americas, um, and they went out in the indigenous communities, um, and obviously the, you know, these people they'd just discovered have bodies, but they couldn't work out whether they had souls, and so they, um, you know, put them through all kinds of rites to work out whether they in fact had souls. What they didn't realize was at the time, um, of course, the indigenous communities um, had been doing uh, kidnapping conquistadors. And of course, they could tell that they had souls because everything has a soul. But they were drowning the bodies to work out whether they had bodies like theirs. And so, you know, Levi Strauss tells this to kind of talk about a, a kind of structural inversion. Why is it an answer in this context? Well, it's an answer because I think what's at stake in those differences are not waitings, in a sense, but forms of life with um, values that perhaps are genuinely different and in conflict with each other. And I think that um, when we talk about climate change and, and when I'm talking about kind of models of subjectivity, that's simply to foreground the way that ultimately maybe what's at stake are really deeper, you know, transformations than, um, than um, or that that would entail, let's say, um, major personal political transformations of the kind we haven't really been talking very much about. Yeah, just to follow on a little bit, I was struck when, when Kate mentioned sort of getting beyond the EIS model, a sort of yes or no, does it help in some sense, given the current situation, some of these transformative ideas you, you're sort of, uh, you just mentioned some of the transformations in terms of ecosystem, but also social transformations, ways that you can sort of get more people, uh, get, a, get a new community along the coast. As we're thinking about these sort of demo, democratic processes that bring everyone into the discussion, to be able to, you know, how do you strike that balance between helping to share some of these possible visions of where things could, could, could become with allowing everyone the chance to um, uh, project, who, does, who, who projects the vision of how the adaptation or resilience strategy could change things? Um, I don't know, that, that certainly goes beyond the ways that I usually think about it in the context of how does the adaptation reduce the, reduce the risk. Well, well that, that, I think that highlights something you brought up in the notion of stress testing, because mm -hmm. stress testing is formally the sort of mechanism by which you, that plays out. And one of the things um, I think has come up over and again, on several occasions, but something I always like to bring up, which is this pairing of risk and resilience, because what you're missing is the opportunity. Yeah. Um, and that's consistent with the IPCC, right? I mean, if you really get into it, there's opportunities here. In fact, we have to communicate that because it isn't always about conflict. Um, there's uh, synergies there, but- No, but, people make lots of money out of this. <laughs> that's right. For sure. Um, uh, I, I certainly understand that. But- <laughs> <laughs> But, what, Radley, going back, I was left, and I think all of us at some point, you reach a threshold of to the extent to which science has practical execution. Um, and that there's a, re at best we can understand that some regional play, right? And we can try to, uh, our ability to localize is limited. You know, if you're a, if you practice in, um, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, you're an architect, St. James River, James River is flooding. You know that you're working in some parameter of a floodplain. You, you're, it's not within uh, flood insurance parameters, but you know, there's some ambiguity there, right? What do you do as a local practitioner? How do you engage, or even you're a planner, maybe you're the planner of Richmond. How do you engage climate science to inform your practice without the necessity of um, specificity necessary that I think we drive to or we, we try to achieve, but it's in fact impossible to achieve uh, with some reliability. Yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, a really challenging question. I think, I think to some extent what it gets, so this raises a couple issues. Um, who has the resources to maybe do these full-scale assessments? Certainly in the context of COP, this is something people are thinking about a lot. To what ex and it also gets at this issue of if you had a million dollars to do a high-resolution downscaling, would it really add any value? Right. Or how much value would it add compared to other ways that you could, you could spend those resources? 
spending on social science, spending on ways to improve our evaluation of adaptation strategies, for example. Um, so that's one issue. I think, you know, the, the, this other distinction is there is incredibly rich local detail, obviously, in the sort of baseline climate, baseline vulnerability to flooding. Every river is different, right? Every neighborhood is different. Um, but it doesn't necessarily follow that when we go to the projections, the amount of sea level rise, the way that temperature will change, that there will be as, as, as much richness in that detail. Um, for you know, large parts of the Northeast, average temperatures you know, may go up by about four degrees or six degrees. The difference in whether it's four degrees or six degrees may be more likely to have, first of all, it may not be that important for planning. Second of all, um, the biggest uncertainty may have to do with something at a much larger scale, um, not the difference between one valley and another. So if we have a decent sense of just the sort of historical base, baseline risk of flooding, I guess that would get back to that point of know the baseline risk, um, try to learn the baseline vulnerability. Maybe you can do a paleo sample where you go sort of find out about a longer history of flooding than, than you can get just from your weather data. Um, that may be a good place to invest your energy um, rather than in the fine scale downscaling of just how much um, you know, storms might change in that place. Of course, the limitation was here, and if Mike Gerard was yeah. here to join us, he would say that once you know it, you can't unknow it, right. and that it opens up a great deal of liability. Yeah. I also, I mean, I, I thought this morning, you know, there was a discussion, maybe it was Christian who was talking about, like, well, this notion of the this ecological machine, right? We're not gonna, we're not gonna retreat, right? I mean, I, I also feel like th that is something that in terms of valuing life forms and valuing um, who is where, I also feel like that, that to me is also the, the concept of retreat in, a, in and of itself is a kind of a fascinating, first of all, it has all this sort of military, you know, kind of connotations to it. But second of all, it has, it, I think it has to do with this notion of undoing as a creative act, you know, and, and the notion of in the James River of actually just simply not being on the James River right, wouldn't right. even come into this conversation. Right. I find that to be really troubling and it does seem like mm -hmm. we do have to get into some, you know, mentality or in, 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 in the sense that, that that is a possibility even from a political standpoint. Obviously, like Saskia mentioned, we just need a different word for retreat, I think, right? Obviously, this word is not helpful it's like okay if if there are large parts of india that you know or that seem to be in a, a sort of a climate zone which is threatening to human health then we we do need to begin to think about the aesthetic project the architectural project the landscape project that values diff different so, life so global capitalism says deterritorialization <laughs> right there's that trope but it's funny or it's not funny it's tragic that when you get to the most, the areas where retreat is really part of the active dialogue in America, um, it is where money doesn't play out as the way you would think. It's about properties that have transitioned from multi-generations that have no mortgage. Their culture is deeply vetted and tied in with that land in a way that you can't so easily disconnect. And so in many ways our neoliberal language that we tend to critique as the state instrument that enforces retreat um, is inadequate because uh, it, there is a preservation element there. And, and in fact, I think as a larger proposition, preservation is not part of the dialogue when it really should be in many, in many ways. But I, I want to cut it off if it's okay because I think we should open up to the audience. Any questions? Sobering view of how the national scale, the legal system, is not quite up right now to dealing with national scale hazards and problems. And so, Kate, I was also struck by your sense of repurposing EISs. It's a very important tool in an environmental planner's toolkit, but it's very flawed. So I, I wanted to ask um, what other, you know, how has the project dealt with say, the regulatory system and local laws that perhaps are always called upon to deal with climate change in terms of building codes and zoning. That's the major tools in the planner's toolkit. Right. No, I, I, I 
I find Michael Gerard's work to be incredibly important. And I also feel like, just to flash back to his talk too, he, he mentioned what struck me in his talk as well, was he this final slide where he was like, well, we need 150, you know, wind turbine yeah. projects at the scale of X in order to even be kind of on this lower red line. And the one turbine project that maybe had a fighting chance got killed in EIS. So after 15 years. Right, after yeah, 15 yeah. years, which we can all, I'm terrified about. But so, so I even feel like as much as we do have the environmental and legal um, frameworks potentially on the books, we have the frameworks like the viewshed law to literally kill anything at the local level. So, um, you know, the only way that this uh, breakwater project has moved through that is because of what I showed about building the public and building the constituency. So now there is an inverse pressure from below to make the project happen, and the advocates are the fishermen. There's a Fishermen's Conservation Association that shows up in every meeting with the hats and the, the buttons, and uh, the oyster people, the school teachers, and so I do feel like I agree that the that EIS process, which is designed to be expensive, you talked about spending another million dollars. That's literally what we are doing: is spending a million dollars uh, uh, to be able to prove this sort of sedimentation uh, pattern on. Um, and you know, so there, it is a very, very difficult um, challenge. And so all I can say is that through these kinds of projects, which are trying to kick the door and um, down a little bit, that ideally they could become sort of legal precedent for other projects um, and help this sort of pathway. There's Natalie. About the methodological innovation that's required that I think you've begun, which is uh, um, to introduce into the public sector this idea of experiment and to have it, to raise the standards of evidence used in design in order to drive design that's accountable to the experimental outcomes. Because these are irreducibly complex socio-ecological systems, no designer, no matter how clever, can you know, give a viable prediction of what's going to happen. And I know that in my experience, whenever you use the word experiment in the public sphere, in fact, I had some very interesting guidance that you should always, when you're talking to DDC or EPA, always use the word innovation. We're doing something innovative. <laughs> and in the art world, you always use the word, word, if you say innovative, it's too instrumental. So you have to use the word Experiment, uh, experimental, right? So that, that to say experiment in the public sphere is not what public agencies can do. They have no, they have to guarantee public safety. They have to guarantee. So the radical work that you're doing to initiate an experimental paradigm is something that I think could be captured as opposed to the idea that, um, that we can develop codes and, you know, which is the anti-experiment, that we can develop guidelines, codes, and rules that designers will comply to <coughs> and demonstrate their compliance. And so this is where the radicalism is of, mm -hmm. of your design, that stochastically, no matter how good the math is, there's no That's compliance right. or risk um, reduction possible, and that the only way to go forward with this irreducible complexity is experiment. So can, I think each of you gave a really interesting material set of circumstances of how the standards of evidence have been raised by you know, where those particles came from, where, you know, how um, doing the core drills, right? How do we trump the embedded interests, the Army Corps and the public processes that completely erase accountability to experimental uncertainty. Yeah. I, I think that's an amazing point. And I think also being um, incredibly um, uh, upfront about the uncertainty, which is that, you know, this panel, I think, is, I mean, the, the word experiment ties closely to uncertainty, too, which is not, it is not a project to solve for X. It is a pilot, which is <laughs> being put into the world to you know, to sort of test its, its limits. And to, yeah. so, so that is the other 
word, I love that you use, use um, innovation because I've been told also to always use the word pilot because, and the fact that, that the, 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 our project is permittable by the DEC is because it is um, big enough to test the different components but small enough to still be called a pilot. All right, All right thank you panelists. Thanks.